When Kelly Cherry walks into the room, the first thing you notice about her, besides her red hair, is her understated poise and tranquility. Here is a woman whose words flow like wine on the page and off. I was lucky enough to take a class with Kelly Cherry last semester, and anyone who has had the privilege to work with her knows her earnest thoughtfulness and serene brilliance. Those who have spent any amount of time with Kelly Cherry know that she longs to understand each individual on several levels deeper than the superficial knowledge of day-to-day -day acquaintance. It is almost as though she wishes to take you into her heart, to take you into the wealth of knowledge inside her head, which no doubt churns and crackles with many intense electrical currents. At the beginning of her classes here at this conference, as well as, I am sure, during the various college courses she has taught, most notably at the University of Wisconsin, Western Washington University, Rhodes College, the Vermont College MFA program, and happily Colgate University, Kelly's foray into our lives begins with her unpredictable, inspired, and wholly imaginative questions. If you could be any type of weather, what would you be? If you could be any kind of furniture, what would you be? Tell me, she says, her eyes alight, about the most amazing moment in your life. Tell me, she says, her head cocked, her mouth smiling, what makes you unique? What makes you special? If I were to try and tell you all the things that made Kelly Cherry unique and special, we could be here until midnight. <coughs> Author of seven novels, a book of short stories, four pieces of nonfiction, 11 chapbooks and poetry collections, and two translations of classical drama, Kelly Cherry's published work takes up whole shelves in many of our houses. Not many people are talented enough or lucky enough to write with precision, carriage, and power in even one genre. Kelly Cherry has triumphed each and every one with such ability that it seems as though with her newest book, History, Passion, Freedom, Death, and Hope, Prose About Poetry, published this year by University of Tampa Press, that she has now transcended all previously held conceptions of genres as solid entities, melding them seamlessly together into a kind of writing all its own. Kelly Chari is a lover of words and what words can convey. In her memoir, Writing the World, she states that words will take you anywhere, and they certainly have taken her to a myriad of spectacular places, including Latvia, the Philippines, England, Scotland, Yalta, and most parts of the United States. Her work has been translated into Russian, Latvian, Chinese, Czech, Spanish, German, Dutch, Swedish, Polish, Lithuanian, and Ukrainian. <laughs> when she was awarded the first James G. Haynes Poetry Prize of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, Kelly Cherry's poetry was decreed to be marked by a firm intellectual passion, a reverent desire to possess the genuine thought of our century, historical, philosophical, and scientific, and a species of powerful, ironic wit that is allied to rare good humor. Her power over language has been recognized by many. She was awarded the Pushcart Prize in 1977, the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in 1980, and the Penn Syndicated Fiction Award in 1983. There's something about Kelly Cherry that lights up your imagination. She encourages from everyone she meets the same steadfast conviction and dedicated radiance which she brings to each fresh day she begins and each piece of work she creates. Tonight she will be reading a story from her book of short stories, A Society of Friends. I am honored to welcome Kelly Cherry to the podium. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, I have to tell everybody, uh, and you'll understand, having just seen Alexis up here, that in fact, I would go into that classroom on really cold, bleak, dreary, <laughs> wind-howling days and uh, look for the, in the last row for Alexis's smile. And then it was like springtime. <laughs> so you can see that already. In fact, I think this might be a good moment at which to um, give a hand to all the interns, as well as to Matt and David, for their help with the conference. Thank you. Um, the story I'm going to read is, I'll, it's a short story, so I hope it won't keep us too late tonight. It has the names of some Czech writers in it that I may not always be able to pronounce correctly. 
and it's a very quiet story that hinges on one really dumb pun that comes up near the end, so listen for that pun. Now, is my voice carrying? Yes. Okay, if a, if a vocal cord starts to give out, somebody in back just wave a hand, all right? The story is titled Chores. Conrad hired a check to shovel his snow. She is a graduate student in mathematics, still in her 20s, with dark revolutionary eyes that shine bright against her absolutely clear, unmade up skin. She enlisted her mother and now he has two Czech women, one in her 50s, scraping and shoveling his sidewalk. He watches them from his bedroom window, peering between the slats of the blind. When Milena answered the ad, he realized she needed the money. He wanted to help. Now he feels like a shit. This is not how he wants to see himself, as landed gentry, an overseer. He wants to be kind. He wants to make broad humanitarian gestures. He wants to be Václav Havel. <laughs> there is a lot of snow. He has a lot of sidewalk, a driveway. Next year, he thinks he will shovel the snow himself. But how will Milena pay her tuition, he wonders. It is good to have things to do, chores to occupy your time. Fortunately, there is no end of things to do in a house you have only recently moved to. There are floors and walls to clean, shelves to build. He buys books, it is his one indulgence, and he needs to put them somewhere. He has designed cabinets for the study. The cabinets are to have glass doors and will take a long time to construct. Many of the books are first editions, not old, but someday they will be. You can say that about an object, not always about a person. And so they deserve a certain respect. And anyway, it is good to have something to do with your time. In the evenings, he sits in his study and tries to read. First editions, alas, are not necessarily more riveting than subsequent ones, but there is always the possibility that a new book will jolt him out of his despair if he can just concentrate on it long enough. He has taken to reading Czech writers, Kundera, Kafka, Chapek, Havel. Eventually, he puts the book down, marking the page with a small copper clip someone had given him. He is not an old man, not even middle-aged, he's only 35, but at this point in the evening, he sometimes forgets, for a moment, where he is, what he means to do, go to bed, even who he is. He will discover a few minutes hence that he has been staring at the wall as if he were watching a slideshow. Their faces like works of art, not life, their marvelous postmodern, oh God, post everything faces. Then he will be annoyed with himself and a little frightened as well. And he will say to himself harshly, snap out of it. And sometimes he will actually snap his fingers too as if he were accompanying himself in a rendition of some well-known refrain back up to his own band. Lying in bed upstairs, the blinds turned against the night and snow. He knows it is snowing again because traffic sounds are muffled, reaching him only as strangled cries, as if automobiles were coughing and dying all up and down his street, as perhaps they are. He draws up a mental list of everything he must do the next day. There is dry cleaning to drop off and pick up. He needs to put salt in the water softener. The list is endless. There are always things to be done. In the winter time, there is snow to be shoveled. Next year, he will do that himself. Unless, of course, Milena is still as much in need of the money as she seemed to be when she answered the ad. Her eyes bright with opportunity, her skin flushing with shame. In April and May, there will be chores to do in the lawn. The hedge to be trimmed, a crab apple tree to be planted, shrubs and flowers to be mulched. 
In the summer, he will mow the grass every Friday afternoon after work, unless it is raining or promising to, in which case he will stay inside, fix himself a drink, and pick up around the house. The pizza boxes from Domino's will have to go into the trash. He can walk the week's, wash the week's dishes while listening to McNeil Lara. The rain will hurl itself against the house, angry at being shut out. Wisconsin seldom has the kind of rain he grew up with, steady all-day downpours. In Wisconsin, the rain lurches across the sky, a stumbling drunken rain god. It'll be raining, but it'll be hot in the house, and he'll run a fan even though the windows are closed, and he'll work on his drink and read and send out for ribs instead of pizza, and there will be the continuous low whoosh of the fan and the rattle of rain on the roof. By then, the house will no longer seem so strange to him. A little strange, maybe. The way any place he could think of would now be strange to him because without them he is a stranger to himself. He no longer knows who he is. He is certainly not Václav Havel, but not so strange. He'll have grown used to it, the way you grew used to being yourself, even if you couldn't say, and who could, who that was. In early September, while the house is still dreaming of summer, winter will wake it soon enough. He'll mow the lawn. Quite likely, he will buy a headset and listen to music. Undisturbed by the roar of the mower, he will listen to Smetna. When she answered the ad, she said, my name is Milena. The accent is placed at the beginning. It is on the first, the first, do you see? Her cheeks were red with a kind of revolutionary fervor, her lashes dark even without mascara, glistening from melted snow like animal fur. It was a soft I, almost an E, a soft L. What an unusual name, he said, smiling, though he knew it might not be unusual at all in Czechoslovakia. You must be very bohemian. <laughs> Before he knows it, it will be the time of year when mice find their way into suburban basements. He'll have to call an exterminator. He'll worry about chemicals, the environment, himself. He'll worry about the mice, their eating poison and crawling off like tiny furry French legionnaires in search of water, <laughs> dying horrible, <laughs> lingering deaths in the laundry sink. He is such a shit. He knows it. Would Havel call an exterminator? Would Kafka? <laughs> As winter approaches, again, he'll have to put up the storm windows. This is a major job requiring several hours. He'll have to take the screens down, then bring the storms up from the basement. He'll have to hose the frame, hose the storms down and wipe them with Windex and then fit them into their frames, which can be tricky especially on the second floor. Then he'll have to rope cock all the windows, more hours. Some chores are major, some are minor, but there are always plenty of things that need doing in a house. After it happened, people said, why don't you get an apartment? It's not as if you need, and then they stopped while he finished the sentence for them, but silently to himself so much space, and he said to them, I thought I'd look for a house. At about the same time, there will be leaves to rake. The leaves fallen from the black walnut tree, the maple seedlings, the locust tree, the newly planted crab apple. He'll like the heft of the handle in his gloved palms, the deep drafts of bright air, the feeling of being alert that you get when you attend to the changing of the seasons. He'll stand in his lawn, leaning against his rake as if it were a staff, and the November sun will slide across his shoulders without really warming him, and he'll be surprised at how fast time goes when you have things to do. The gutters will need cleaning. The outside faucet must be turned off. He may have to call a chimney sweep, a cement contractor. He could plant bulbs, and in the spring there would be tulips and hyacinths. He will definitely buy a tape of the Moldau and listen to it via earphones as he mows the lawn, and the tulips and hyacinths, if he has gotten them in, will stand tall and straight as if they were listening also 
just waiting for the proper moment to applaud. In the evenings, he'll read, opening glass doors and taking from the cabinet some book or other and settling into the chair in the study. Sometimes he'll forget for a moment who and where he is and when he remembers these things, that he is head of a medical library, that he is in the house he bought because it is within easy walking distance of work. If they had been walking, not driving, the freezing rain turned the Subaru into a bobsled, that he is still a young man. When he remembers, he is stunned to realize how easy it is to lose track of everything, to let go. Suppose you could forget to live in the world. Suppose you could forget to eat, to sleep, to wake up, ever. You could wander through your dreams forever, an echoing hallway lined with candles in sconces, the flames blurring into the jittery darkness, shadows of varying depth, some as deep as time. In his bedroom, he'll empty his pockets, dropping the loose change into a small brass tray on the bureau. He'll turn the blinds against the snow in the night. By now, he'll know the couple next door, the Wallaces, because she is a nurse at the hospital and he has met her walking to and from her shift, and they have acquaintances in common. He will know the woman with the dog who lives across the street. He will be a fixture in the neighborhood. If he runs out of things to do around the house, he can offer to help out. There is a widow who could surely use some help. He can mow her lawn. He can shovel her snow if the boy she hires fails to show up. The kids in this city, they turn 16. They get a driving license. They can make much better money at McDonald's. Only third-year graduate students in mathematics are desperate enough to hire themselves out as snow shovelers. <laughs> Only women from Czechoslovakia are willing to get out of bed at six in the morning and walk several blocks to shovel snow. When he wakes, he hears them scraping and shoveling, Milena and her mother. It is what calls him back from the mysterious place he has been, the hallway lighted by candles in sconces, their shape-shifting flames when he wakes. He tries to think of everything he knows about Czechoslovakia, anything, King Winslas or Alexander Dubček. Though he was only 12, he remembers television images of Dubček on a bal balcony. He remembers the words Prague Spring like the title of a song. The tanks lumbered through downtown Prague, stiff with arthritis. The soldiers, boys who would be middle-aged now, but he remembers them as younger than he is, remembers their confusion, their haircuts that made them look overexposed, as if they were not flesh at all, but just pure film. He lies there listening to Milena and her mother, and he feels like a totalitarian government, but all he wanted to do was help. He expected a teenage boy to answer his ad, but it was Milena who called, Milena who came by to look at the sidewalk and driveway and say, yes, she could handle it. Her eyes were dark, shining with an inner light, and her skin, bare of makeup, was like a part of the world he had never visited, full of points of interest, her cheeks as red as the Communist Manifesto, her mouth as mobile as America. He hired her. He didn't want to be sexist. She straightened her shoulders and raised her arms as if she were flexing her biceps, but of course she had on her coat, and so it was only a gesture not for real, and said, I am very strong. He had never met for her to put her mother to work too. It is good for her health, she said, speaking for her mother, even though he knew her mother spoke English, at least some. Milena and her mother worked in concert, a New World Symphony. Downstairs in the kitchen, he confronts the pizza box that he left out last night and that now smirks at him from the vinyl cloth table, gaping like a mouth, dried tomato, tomato paste clinging to the sides. He stuffs it into a hefty bag and ties off the bag with a blue twist. He has dry cleaning to drop off on his way to work, to pick up on his way home. He must go to the grocery store. He needs milk, bread, salt for the front stoop. 
There is so much he has to do. He never understood just how much there is to do. She had done so much of it cheerfully, efficiently, never complaining. She had been on the way to the store when it happened, Caleb not yet five. He realizes now that there are baseboards to be scrubbed, floors to be waxed, moldings to be dusted, radiators to be vacuumed. There are toilets that want scouring, waste baskets that want emptying, sheets that want ch changing, walls to contemplate painting. He is building bookshelves, cabinets with glass doors, doors that will open and shut with a polite, satisfying click, the sound that things make when they acknowledge their gratitude, knowing they have their own place and are safely in it. As he has and is here in this house that is within walking distance of where he works, but how dark it is when he arrives home in the evening, how terribly, dreadfully dark. He turns the key in the lock and enters the hallway, his shoes leaving a Hansel and Gretel trail of salt and melting snow. He hangs the dry cleaning in the hall closet. He hangs his anorak in the closet, slipping the loop inside the collar over a hook on the wall. He finds his way in the dark to the lamp in the living room, and when he turns it on, the light is as sudden as accidental death. For a moment, he forgets where he is, who he is. He stands there blinking, his shoes as heavy as chains, a worker's chains, the chains of a man whose life is a chore, the room dancing in and out of the out of the lamplight. Then he remembers and he goes to the study, picks up a book and settles down to read. This book could be by Hasek, Seifert, or Skorveski. From time to time he looks up from the book and stares out the window. It has begun to snow again. He can see it tumbling around the street light, a busy snow, a well-traveled snow blown this way and that, up from Iowa, down from Minnesota, by a no-nonsense Midwestern wind. Now the whiteness is everywhere. It has filled up the rectangle of window like milk poured into a glass. Upstairs, undressing, he turns the blinds against the snow in the night, but then he pulls two slats apart and peers out between them. Milena must come in the morning with her mother. The shovels are waiting for them on the front stoop. Mathematics, he'd asked, startled, impressed. Her eyes shone like candles in sconces. Her lashes were as dark as shadows. Color bloomed in her face, a kind of warmth, like springtime, though it was snowing and she had on her coat a fur hat. I can't even balance my checkbook, he said becoming aware of what he had said only as he said it. And then he was blushing too, while she looked at him with a mild pity, perhaps the way she regarded all Americans as a weak people with money and bad puns. She is strong and beautiful and smart, a worthy compatriot of Václav Havel. Sometimes he forgets himself, everything, almost everything, and then he is annoyed with himself and a little frightened as well. But he is also a little proud of himself, amazed by his own great weakness, his enormous weakness, for he is capable of far more weakness than he ever suspected might be in him. He never knew how easily he could be defeated. The snow dashes across the street in drifts. The sky seems to have dropped and clouds lie over the street the sidewalk, the driveway. Who is he? What did he mean to do? Wasn't there a dream, a dream he woke from? These are questions he asks himself when he has time on his hands, when he has nothing to do, nothing to keep him from thinking about a future as oppressive as the history of a small Eastern European country. Thank you.